So we're calling this series, Follow Me. And really what I'm doing in this throughout this series, and it might very well take me the rest of my preaching career here, um, we're looking at early conversations that Jesus had in the gospel and, and, and just kind of trying to get back to basics maybe and maybe strip away stuff that we've added to the gospel. I remember somebody told me once the gospel is like a, a diamond sitting on top of a big dunghill. And what happens generation after generation, that diamond starts rolling downhill because gravity works. And every generation, our job generationally is to grab that diamond and wipe all the junk off it and get it back to the top of that pile. So that's kind of what we're doing with this follow me, just trying to get back to basics and stripping away all the stuff that maybe got in the way of our, our walk with Christ. Um, and in order to do this morning, we are going to be exposed, <laughs> not to each other, um, but to ourselves. Um, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 8. We're going to spend the whole time in chapter 8. If you've got your Bibles with you, you can follow along there. We'll have the scriptures that I'll be using up on the screen um, behind me also. But in Mark chapter 8, <clears throat> Jesus, used, Jesus notices a, a division in his crowd, right? A lot, a lot of people have been following Jesus because he's, he's just an amazing guy. He's doing these miracles, and he's telling people, giving people words of life, and, and they're, just, they're just finding joy again in a life that had been beating them up. And they heard the words of Jesus, and they just thought, wow, this, this is amazing. This, this teacher is, this is, this, this guy is amazing. Um, but he began to notice that he had like two groups of people. He had followers, and what we would call in our today, in our culture, we would, have, we would call them consumers, so we got followers and consumers. And, and if we're really honest with ourselves, um, being a follower of Jesus Christ is, is a pretty good deal. Right. You know, there, there's a lot of gain by being a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, bottom line, you, more than likely, you will become a better person. You will become a more likable person, right? When Satan controlled your life, you were kind of mean and selfish, and other people noticed that, although you might not have noticed it. But when Christ came into your life and his Holy Spirit began to direct you and point things out, you became a nice person. And people go, wow, you've changed. And you say, yeah, because Jesus is in my life now. Um, you, you, heaven, you know, <laughs> great deal. An overwhelming faith. And what I mean by that is a faith that when the world throws its worst at you, your faith wins, right? Your faith overwhelms anything that this world has to offer you. So there are some fantastic benefits to being a follower of Jesus Christ. And the fact is, I'm, I'm guessing you all, you all remember Jesus' parable about the the people who built their house on sand and the folks who built their house on rock, right? People who built their house on sand, built their house on selfish motives themselves. And the storms of the world came and what happened to their life? But the people who built their house on the, raw, the solid rock of Jesus Christ, the storms of the world come and their, their life stands. It doesn't, it doesn't cave. And so we've all seen people who built their lives on sand and we've seen people who built their lives on rock. So we all, we, we, all, we, we understand this idea, but what we we tend to miss as we kind of get excited about, oh, this is fantastic. I'm a Christian, and all these things are now coming to me, the abundant life, shalom, everything that God had intended for me, but I'd been missing out because I was being selfish and I was living for myself. Suddenly, all this, these wonderful things are coming my way. Even in the midst of the crazy world, these beautiful things like grace and forgiveness and mercy start making their way into my life. But the fact of the matter is, and, and again, this is something we, we struggle with, genie, Jesus isn't the genie in the Bible. And we tend to do that, although we would, would certainly never use those words, but we tend to look at Jesus as, what can he do for me? What, what can I get out of... Not, and we don't, even, we don't even make it that crass. We don't sit there at home and go, what, what, what can I get out of Jesus? Right? We read God's word and we, we see that he does amazing things for people and he gives them life and we think, wow, I need life because my life is like dead. And, and we're amazed, and we're amazed at what he does. But we're all going to come to that point um, two or three times, maybe several thousand times. Um, these things will, will only come at a cost. Um, they're not for free. Take, take a look at that this morning. Um, chapter 8, again, halfway through Mark's gospel, it's, it's a turning point for the book of Mark. There's 16 chapters. The first eight chapters is on his way to Jerusalem, and the last eight chapters, Jerusalem, the, the, the Passion Week. Um, in Mark chapter 8, I'm going to start reading in verse 27. Time is short. Jesus will begin to wonder, okay, I'm on my, you know, it's the final week of my life, and do people understand who I am and what I'm about? Two things. Do they understand who I am and what I'm going to be about? So Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, who do people say I am? 
That's the first half of the equation. And they responded. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. And Jesus pressed, verse 29. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you're the Messiah. Now, let's just make sure we're all really clear on this right now. If you're a Hebrew speaker, you would be saying this is Yeshua, the Messiah. And if you were a Greek speaker, you would say this is Jesus the Christ. His name, his last name is not Messiah or Christ, right? So it's not Jesus Christ, like he's got a middle name somewhere, right? So it's Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, the one that we've been waiting for for hundreds of thousands of years that will come and usher us into this new age. So this, this is the Messiah. Um, and, and Peter nails it, but Jesus replies in what would seem kind of a strange, strange way. He's, he's kind of asking him, do you know what I, who I am? And Peter got it right. And then he says, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. <clears throat> Again, because they got the first half right, you know who I am. But do you really know what messiahship is about? Do you know what being the Christos, the anointed one, do you understand what it's about? You, you, you say it correctly that I am that person, but do you truly, truly understand? So Jesus begins to speak, and he begins to tell the crowd, make sure that they understand. In verse 31, it says, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and worse, that he must be killed and after three days raise again rise again. Um, he spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, you got to kind of picture the scene here. Peter, you know, um, the crowd is all excited because, like, Jesus has been walking on water. He's been healing people. And, and, and you can see him pulling Jesus off the side and says, dude, what are you, what are you doing? Right? We had them. They were following us, right? We fed a big old crowd, and they're like, oh, man, they're all about, we have a, we have a following. Stop talking negatively, Jesus. Right? Talk about the good stuff that you're going to do for people. Talk about how you're going to change their lives. Don't, but no, don't, you're, 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 blow, you're, 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 you're down in the troops, right? This is not a good general's message to the troops. Stop it, Jesus. Jesus replies, get behind me, Satan. So why does Jesus so sternly rebuke Peter? If you think about it, Peter was wording, putting into words the very temptations that Satan had tempted Jesus with three years earlier. Peter has now become the mouthpiece for Satan. Jesus, don't do it the way your heavenly father wants you to do it. I got a better way. Don't speak about cost. Don't speak about denying yourself. Don't, no, don't go down that road. Everybody will just go away and we won't have a following anymore. We'll have an empty church. That won't be any good. Right? And then you'll get fired. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't, don't go crazy on us here. Get behind me, Satan. At this moment, he is refighting the battles of the temptations in the wilderness. And he's a little bit concerned. Um, again, time is running out. Jesus, does, is he going to cut corners? Um, is he going to take a shortcut? You know, does he really have to go through all that pain? And if you look in the book of John, in the, in the Passion, it... it uh, we're in the book of Mark now. One of the other gospels is the book of John. And, and when you read in the book of John, there's just this incredible, please, 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 if there's any other way that we can do this, please, Father, I'll, let's, let's talk about this, right? You just get that impression that, that he's not thrilled to die. He's just, this, this isn't really, I mean, if there's any other way, Father, that would be fantastic. But Jesus, for Jesus, this was a defining moment. This could make or break the mission. A lot of you grew up with Charlie Brown, Peanuts. Charlie Brown was always put into a position to be the hero or the goat, right? He's always the hero, where well, we know what he always ended up being, the goat. He always made a wrong decision. He didn't measure up. Something didn't turn out right. And this morning, for a lot of you, there's something that's been on your mind and the way you decide this thing, whatever it is, I don't know what it is, it, it'll be your defining moment. Whatever it is, it might require some kind of compromise. And you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, but if it's a, it's a little compromise, but it's going to have a really, really godly result, so I'm pretty sure that God's going to be okay with this. It might be having to do with your career. It might have to do with your financial situation. It might have to do with your relationship with your family, your kids, your wife, your husband. It might, I don't know what it has to do, but I'm, I, I, 
you're all human beings. I, I know for a fact that we all face these decisions on a regular basis. Do I do it Jesus' way or do I do it what would apparently be the smarter way? Less cost, but I'll have to take a shortcut. But will anybody really notice and will it really affect the end product if I cheat? Not, not even cheat, but just take a shortcut because the way that Christ is leading me is going to cost too much, and he doesn't want me to suffer. He loves me. So I just want to take a time out right here, and I just want to pray. I want to open up our altars. Um, one of our musicians is going to come up here and play a little bit, and just, just, just a time of prayer, and, and we're going to dig into God's Word, and, and, and I believe God's Word is going to help you in whatever that situation is that's facing you right now, that there's Jesus' way or this way that you've been contemplating. And I don't know what, what sphere it is in your life, but I, I believe because you are human beings that you face these decisions on a regular basis. And I want to give you power this morning from God's Word. Your Heavenly Father wants to give you power. He wants to give you a way out because His Word says that He won't... He won't take away all of our horrible situations, but he will, in the face of any kind of temptation, he will give us a way out if we look for it. You will find a way out. So the choice that you've been thinking and you've told yourself, that's my only option, that's Satan lying to you. That's not your only option. You can also go Jesus' way. And you've discounted it because it's not smart in the ways of the world. And this morning, your Heavenly Father wants you to just stop, pause, take a break, and think about this. Let his Holy Spirit help you find Jesus' way out of whatever your situation is facing you this morning. So right now, Father, if you'd all just bow your heads and we can just pray for a moment. Father, this morning, again, we live in a broken world, so I, I, I just know for a fact that we, on a daily basis, every person in this room faces a decision to do it the Jesus way or our way. And so many times, Father, the Jesus way just doesn't appear to be very smart and, and the way that we've planned it all out just appears to be a far smarter way of going about it. Less people will hurt, more, less people will, will have to pay. Um, but your Holy Spirit just keeps quietly whispering in your ears, you're not the one that's going to have to pay for this. I already paid for it. And I will continue to pay for it, but I need you to follow me. I need you to take these next steps. You will not be ashamed. I promise you. So, Father, this morning, every person in this room, whatever they're facing, by the power of your Holy Spirit, Father, just guide them this morning. Through your, your gospel writer, Mark, and through the words of your son, through Mark, show us a way out, Father. Show us the way that you would have us take in our own individual lives, in the lives of our family, in the lives of this church, in the lives of our community, and in, in all the different ways that we are in relationship with your world. Father, we know for a fact that there's a your way and there's an our way. There's a God's kingdom way and there's the way of the world way. And this morning, Father, give us strength to take your way. Show us the way, give us courage, and walk beside us. You promised all these things. So we're only asking what you already promised that you would do for us, Father. And we want to thank you right now in advance for everything that you're going to do, for every person who decides to kneel before you and submit their will to your will, Father, thank you for amazing them and showing them that you are truly the creator God of the universe, the one who saves us, the one who gives us community. Father, thank you for your Son. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I, I pray these words. Father, help us to continue to worship you this morning. Amen. So we're looking at defining moments this morning. What decisions that we make in our life that change the course of everything. Because they were significant decisions. They were decisions that were weighty. And they would change things. They would change people's lives. It wasn't just, will I have tacos or chicken tonight? Right? Will I do it Jesus' way? Will I do it? my way, defining moments. And there was a defining moment here in Peter's life, in, in Jesus Christ's life. Particularly in Jesus' life, he, this was a decision he wasn't real thrilled about. He didn't really want to die. And says, like, Father, if there's any other way, let's do it that way, um, because this is going to be pretty rough for me. 
And um, if, there's, if there's another way, um, and, and, and Peter spoke into Jesus' fears. We do that to each other sometimes, don't we? God says that, that he's called me to do something else, and we'll kind of step alongside. Well, you know, maybe he wasn't that serious. Well, you know, maybe he doesn't expect you to. Don't take it too seriously. And we start downplaying what God has called people to do. And we need to stop doing that. When God calls someone to do something amazing, just back them up. Just start saying, okay, I'll start praying for that miracle. <laughs> and don't look at my eye because they'll think that they're nuts. But, you know, <laughs> it'll take a miracle for them and God to work in your life. Don't, no, that, that, that won't be it. But Peter, Peter responds, spoke right into Jesus' fear. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And he adds these words in Mark 8, chapter verse, verses 33. He says, Here was the, here's the problem. Here's the issue right here. Um, you do not have in mind the concerns of God but merely human concerns. And this is a big verse for a lot of us. Peter is like, you're acting like a consumer, right? You're not following me, you're consuming me. It's like, you don't care about me, you care about what I can give you. You've all had friends like that. Right? You've known people like that. You're only acting, or you're acting like you're in it because of what you can get out of it, and you're not concerned about what will happen to me. You're concerned about what will happen to you because of what will happen to me. And Jesus is saying, look, if you're going to follow closely to me, you need to start expecting that there's going to be a cost. I need to know, if things get rough, will you still follow me or will you fall away when things get difficult? Jesus, again, takes the opportunity to teach the crowd. Verse 34, he says, then said to the crowd along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. He tells them, eyeball to eyeball, eyeball. here's what's going to happen next to you, to me. And if we all stay together in a group and we go follow Jesus, it's going to happen to all of us together. We're going to gain and we're going to lose, but we're going to do this all um, together. And if you think this is only about being a better person or getting a better marriage or getting a better relationship with your children, I mean, somebody has misled you. Maybe I've misled you. This is not what it means to follow Jesus Christ. This isn't the purpose of following Jesus Christ is to have a better life, to have better finances, to have better children, to have a more lovely wife. That, that, that's all on you. <laughs> but Jesus is saying, look, if you follow me, there's going to be a time when I want to do something and you want to do something and there's going to be a conflict and there's going to be a conflict of interest and you're going to have to deny your sake, your will for my sake. See, we love the benefits, but we don't like the premiums. You know, we looked at this last week. We love what Jesus does for us, he loves what he gives to us. We don't necessarily like what it occasionally costs us, right? We looked again a couple weeks ago. We want Jesus truth without the Jesus way, which will never lead to the Jesus life. Here's a fun fact. Jesus isn't all that unique in asking us to deny ourselves. Fact of the matter is, there are a whole bunch of aspects of your life that ask you to deny yourself and actually ask you far more than what Jesus asked for your education. You had to give up a lot to get your education. You denied yourself. If you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. You have denied yourself. A lot of naps, right? You've denied yourselves a lot of life's quiet reading afternoons to read boom, bam, boom, bam, chicka, boom, chicka, boom, boom, baby. Oh, my goodness. Don't, don't even. Oh, wow. <laughs> Still have nightmares on that one. All these things in our lives, they ask a lot for us. But the fact of the matter is they don't give back nearly what Jesus gives back for what he's asking for. He's saying that there will be intersections in your life. There will be crossroads where you'll be offered the world. It's like Satan offered Jesus. You will be offered amazing things. And at that crossroad, you'll have to make a decision. My soul or my things? I'm a blues aficionado, love blues. You all understand that the deal that Robert Johnson made at the crossroads with the devil supposedly... Gave up his soul to be an incredible blues guitar player. Would that have been worth it? To give up your soul to be the world's greatest guitar player. Would, would, would that have been worth 
I, you know, I don't know. And, and again, you're going to come up with these, these, these intersections, these crossroads, these points of decision, and you're going to have to make a decision. Will you be a consumer or will you be a follower? It's awesome walking on water. It's awesome that your mother-in-law has been healed. A little conflicted on that one. But um, here's the deal. Most people have decided they don't want to follow Jesus Christ because they're just not sure it's worth it. They're just not sure it's worth it. And this is why many people leave the church. It's not that they don't believe in God. It's not, oh, they, they, they repent and they believe, they repent and they believe, but I just don't want to follow. I don't want to do all that stuff. I believe he's the son of God. I believe he died for my sins. I believe, I believe, I believe, but don't make me do all of that. And we think somehow we're going to enjoy the abundant life by simply repenting and believing, repenting and believing, and not doing the things that Jesus did that led to abundant life. I think we're just, we're just fooling ourselves. And, and here's, here's the kicker. Um, we, 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 we don't because it'll cost so much. And then this is where Jesus, like, just, he knocks it out of the park. I'm just going to, I'm going to amaze you. I'm going to let Jesus amaze you right now, right? So here's what Jesus says to the crowd that's wondering, is it worth it? Listen very carefully. For whoever wants to save their life, would you raise your hand if you want to save your life? Raise your hand. Great. Jesus is a great communicator, right? Right here at the start, he's got all of you on board. All right, we're behind you, Jesus, okay? Forever who wants to save their lives, um, for whoever wants to save their lives will lose it. Okay, the first truth is you all agreed you want to save your lives. Here's the second truth a lot of us don't like to face. You will lose your life. I don't care how many vegetables your wife makes you eat. I don't know how, how many smoothies, gross smoothies that she makes you drink in the morning. I don't care how much bad, bad cholesterol that you don't take. I don't care how many bad habits. You will die. You will all die. All right? So we got two facts on the table. We all good with this. You all want to save your lives. You all want to live forever. But the fact of the matter is you all are going to die. Are we good with that? I didn't depress anybody too horribly. All right. Let's keep moving here. Um... <laughs> Continue. Uh, verse 35. Um, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Now, this is crucial. And I'm not just talking your life like you're breathing and not breathing life. I'm talking the life that God wants to give you, the shalom life, all the richness and all the joy and all the significance and purpose in the world that he wants to give you. That's what you can have. If we die, now this is crucial. We all die, but if we choose to give up our prerogatives, if we choose to give up our rights, which we're going to lose anyway, we're going to lose our prerogatives, we're going to lose our rights. If we choose to give up our life, we're going to lose it anyway. If we choose to give up these things that we're going to lose anyway, then God says, hey, you know what? I'm going to save it. This is going to be amazing. In other words, hit that next slide there. Lose the life that you're trying to save, and I'll give you a life worth living. This is what he's saying to the crowd who's wondering, is following you worth it a life of purpose and a life of meaning again he's not unique in what he asked but he's completely unique in what he gives us in return the life of a hero we're honoring today heroes this is memorial day weekend we've been honoring them all week and tomorrow will be the bigger day these are people who decided you know i, I could choose to live my life and protect myself or i could put myself out there and possibly lose my life. And a lot of them did, and we, we honor them today. They made that decision to give up their life, but they gained something very significant in return. They gained a life that, was, that we, we enjoy what they died for just sitting here this morning in an open worship space. Lose the life you're trying to save, and I'll give you a life worth living. But he's not done yet. Listen to this. It says, for what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit your soul? Let's imagine for a moment that you have everything in the world. The whole world is yours. You are Michael Jordan. You, you not only have athletic skills, but you got money. You don't even know what to do with it. You're just you're like you own a softball team. It's just crazy. You got, every, you got the whole world. It's all yours. But in exchange, you lose your soul. Either now or in the world to come. Good deal? Anybody? Good deal? And while they're thinking about this, because they're thinking about it, well, I don't know, um, Jesus <laughs> asked them another question. Um, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit the soul? What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? In the end, realizing that you've gotten everything, but you forfeited your soul, what would you trade back? Would, it, would anybody raise your hand and say anything and everything? 
What if you realize at the end of your life that, oh, that wasn't a good trade? Oh, what would you give to, give your, to get your soul back? You would give everything. You would give absolutely everything. Jesus continues. You would trade everything, give everything away. You've just discovered something important about yourself. Your soul is greater than your things because you would be willing to give up all your things to get your soul back. But at the front end of that decision, we somehow, we don't, we don't arrive at that exchange somehow. We go ahead and make the crossroads switch, the choice at the crossroads. He's saying if we give up our stuff voluntarily, that we would have had to have given up anyway, we can give it up in such a way as to affect our eternity and the eternity of the people around us if we give it up according to his will. But he's not done yet. Listen to this, verse 38 says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. How many of you have ever been ashamed of something you did or a relationship you had? Would you just... Okay. What Jesus is saying right here is you will never be ashamed of the fact that you chose me. You will never be ashamed of the fact that you chose me the Jesus way. Even though all your friends said, wow, what a milk toast, what a weakling. All your friends made fun of you when you gave your 10% to the church. What a waste of money. What are you doing? Your whole world said, why are you doing these things? And Jesus is saying right here, you will never be ashamed. You will never look back and go, wow, that was a dumb decision. And then he adds to it. No matter how bad you are, no matter how dumb you've been, no matter how many mistakes you've made, he's saying right here that if you choose my way, if you're not ashamed of me, when I stand before my father, I'm not going to be ashamed of all the silly stuff that you did. I'm going to present you as clean and holy. We're just all the crazy, you all know what I'm talking about. All that will be gone. You will have no shame whatsoever because you chose my father. And because you chose my father, I will choose you. I don't care how big a mess you are. You are not ashamed. You are not shameful in my eyes. Beautiful passage here. And here's the good news, right? Peter's like, I'll never, I'll never be ashamed of you, right? Like, and then a little middle school girl points at him and he, he runs, ah. And what does Jesus say, right? Out of the pool, party's over. <laughs> you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. No, he says, you're forgiven. And by the way, I'm going to put you in charge of everything. And by the way, stop doing that. There's no shame. Shame is removed entirely by following Jesus, by choosing the Jesus way. You're going to be honored. And I don't know how you're going to be honored. It might be in this lifetime. It might be in this very hour. It might be way down the road. You might not ever see it, but the people around you will, to their dying day, thank God for you because you chose Jesus' way instead of your way. You live by faith. When we choose Jesus' way, we know that we are making a difference. We know that we are bringing salvation closer and closer to the people around us. When we choose Jesus' way, the way we act matters. We can repent and we can believe and we can repent and believe till the cows come home, till Christ returns. But we're not making the impact that we're called to make if we're not following, doing the, God, the loving, crazy things that Jesus did. Here's the moral of the lesson. Let's, let's land this plane. Salvation is free. Y'all know that, right? It cost us nothing. Jesus paid for all of it. You can't do anything to earn it. It's free to all who ask and trust in what Jesus accomplished on the cross. The total defeat of sin and death. But, yeah, there's always a but, even in church. Following Jesus eventually costs us something. In your lifestyle, in your relationships, your financial decisions, your work, your career. At some point, a trade-off will be demanded a conflict of interest will present itself, Jesus' way or my way. And what hurts so badly is a lot of times my way will appear to have godly results, and Jesus' way will have nothing but horrible results. But that's where we trust our Heavenly Father, the fact that He's a good, good Father. Even though we don't see the rationale of it when we choose Jesus' way, He takes care of that end of it. And I'll tell you what, this is, this is kind of my warning here. It's going to feel like a moral imperative. Okay, that's something that it feels like one of the Ten Commandments, but it's really not, right? God's going to ask you, you're, you're going to be in a situation that you've done it a thousand times this way, and suddenly God's Spirit is going to kind of just 
whisper in your ear, I want you to do it this way. And if you don't, this is not going to work out well. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute, all, all I'm doing is I'm going down to the corner and having a coffee with this person. What, what I'm not killing anybody. I'm not stealing. I'm not lying. I'm not cussing. I'm not doing any of the Ten Commandments. But well, what do you mean the way I'm having coffee? What? And again, it's going to feel like that. And it's going to be God's conscious pricking your conscious and just saying, you know what? Not God's conscious. God, the Holy Spirit pricking your conscious and saying, you know what? The, you don't understand it, but what you're doing right now, I don't want you to do anymore. I need you to stop. Just trust me on this. I need you to do it a different way from here on out. And again, it will feel like death because you've always been doing it this way and it's always worked for you. You've always gone that route. And in the back of your mind, you're going, well, if I go this route, then this is going to happen. This is going to happen. You know, my kids are going to love me and they're going to obey everything I do. And my, you know, all, this, all these all wonderful, beautiful, wonderful, beautiful things are going to happen um, if I choose this particular way. Um, and in order to choose Jesus', Jesus way, you're going to have to let that way die. And again, it will, might have been one of your dreams. One day I'm going to drive that kind of car. One day... I'm going to be this kind of person. One day, I'm going to be viewed as whatever. One day. And if you choose the Jesus way, and it is, there is a conflict, it will feel like a death. You will have to give up something. But here's what else is true, absolutely true. It will be a defining moment for you. You will either be a hero or a goat. You'll either be Charlie Brown or Linus. I don't know how many comparisons I can get here. But it will be a defining moment for you, how you decide. And again, we walked into this place this morning, and I just, I know for a fact that we all have these decisions that are kind of weighing on us. We don't know what we're going to do about them. So you've been given God's truth this morning. You've been given the Jesus truth. And if you want the Jesus life, you're going to have to take the Jesus way and whatever that is that you've been thinking about, that cost, and it's in the back of your mind right now, and you're thinking, oh, tell Jerry to shut up. <laughs> tell him to stop talking. Let's bow our heads. Father, whatever it is that folks are facing in this place today, they have been given a choice of life and death, of your way and their way. Father, you've made very clear to us that when we make those wrong decisions, we will regret them. We will be ashamed of them. But Father, if we choose your way, if we choose the Jesus way, we will never be ashamed. And you'll never be ashamed of us. Father, give us courage, give us strength. Make us heroes. Make us heroes of faith. That the people that follow us would look up to us and say, yeah, I'm going to stick to it because they did. And their life is beautiful. Father, help us to live beautiful lives that shine in the darkness. Father, thank you for those men and women in uniform that gave their lives. They didn't plan on it, but they put, they put themselves in that position and they paid the ultimate price. So, Father, every family, that on this day, it's not a celebration day. It's an incredibly painful day. Father, that your spirit would convince them that their loved ones were heroes. Father, thank you for showing us the way in your son how to be a hero. In his name I pray. Amen. Folks, have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful weekend. Nice day off tomorrow, Memorial Day. Um, be a blessing. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.